Okay, so let's go back to the lecture, right? Uh, this is, uh, you can also treat this part as something will be tested, but more, most importantly, just the concept, right? So last time we talked about the effect of the wire capacitance on the load, right? So last time we say that right, the loading is not just the wire when we drive this, uh, when we use this inverter to drive this uh, leak stage. Yeah, you do have the wire capacitance, but I also have the CDB2, CDB1, both the uh, PMOS and MOS, they have the capacitor, right? I'm going to review this. Maybe let's just review now. That would be even better, right? So if you remember for a transistor, right, we have how many capacitor? C, C, G, D, C, G, S, right? And then we also have the body C, S, B, right? And then uh, C, uh, D, B, correct? And also, of course, between here, we have C, G, B, right? We have five capacitors that, but their magnitude keep changing, right? And last time I told you that C, G, S is not connected to the output. So we don't have to consider CGS, right? How about CSB and CDB? Uh, I mean, CSB, uh, how about CSB and CGB? CGB in this state, or well, we also no need to consider because it's not the output, does not connect to the output node. So we only have uh, CDG, the, this is string, remember? This is the string for both devices because this is PMOS, this is MOS, the drink for MOS is at higher potential. The drink for PMOS is at lower potential, right? So we have CDB2, CDB1. At the same time, we also have CGD, right? The CG and D, CGD uh, here, and also CGD for one and CGD for two. So in prior, there are four capacitors, but we just lump this as CGD12, right? But then if you look at the input output, the, the loading, Right, you also have CG. This time we just lump all the CG together for this simplified analysis. Okay, so basically your loading capacitance is the wire capacitance plus CDB2, CDB1, CGD12, and also CG3 and CG4. Right, so last time a student asked me why CGD12 is also a part of the capacitor. This is a very good question, right? Uh, this is because one of the node is at D. And although this node is changing, and that's what I showed him last time, like right? for a regular capacitor, you agree that if this is grounded, I change this from zero to one volt. I need to add current, right? Otherwise I cannot change this from zero to one volt, right? And the capacitor is Q over V. The amount of charge, I need to bring up the voltage. We mentioned many times already, including the depletion capacitance, it's just the charge divided V, right? How much charge we need to supply or take away in order to change the voltage. And similarly for this one, although this is not grounded, but this V in might go to other opposite direction. Then it's the same that if I need to bring up the voltage from zero to one, I need to apply some current, right? So that's why, uh, this one also contributes to the loading to the output. And indeed, this is words. We call them call it Mueller capacitor. We are going to discuss after the midterm. Okay. Any questions on this line? So CW is everything in the grayed out box? Out uh, box? It, it, everything on this line, this wire. Gray, gray out box is CG4 and CG3. CW is the wire cap. So you have an inverter here, right? In reality, you have a very long line. This is the line that drive you from one stage to another stage. You have cap to the ground. You might have another wire next to it that has another capacitor. Is that okay? 
Uh, yeah, so how come we don't consider the capacitance of the gate and drain and gate and source for the M3 and M4? We do. We lump them together. This is just, we call it CG4, right? So it actually is CG uh, D4, CG S4, CG B4. We just lump them together for now. We call it this name. Oh, but we don't consider the, the body capacitance for the M3 and M4. We do consider body from G to body, gate to body. But body has nothing to do with this node. It's be just because of GB. We do consider G to body. Right, I put CGB4. But we lump them together as one single capacitor in this particular slide. Okay, got it. Right, you look at here, right? This is important right? because it's not something a part of our exam, right? Related. If you look down here, you see three capacitors CGS, CGD, and CGB. And all together, I call it CG4. But this is a complicated case. You have it is voltage dependent. Right, but we we'll just call it CG4 for now. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Got okay, it. Okay, great. Good question, right? So basically, just to let you know, this wire capacitance is important, right? So for wire capacitance, how do we calculate? I think you know very well, it's just the dielectric constant divided by the thickness, right? So we have a substrate here, and we have a dielectric, maybe oxide is epsilon dy divided by tdi. And then the total capacitance is width times length. Okay, is that okay? But this is only valid for parallel plate. It means that I need the W has to much, much larger than H, right? Imagine this case. If I have the ground substrate, and then I have a wire like this. This is H and this is W. This one will break down because I have a lot of fringe, fringing capacitance, right? It's not just underneath. Right, this may be oxide. Okay, is that okay? Right, so basically when you scale the device, we, how do we scale? We, we scale uh, two things. Last time I told you, right? One is that we, we might make the uh, width and L smaller. I mean, sorry, width and also H smaller, right? So W and H scale by S, for example, two times. But the length is scale by another scale. This is because this length is used for, to connect a chip from one place to another place. So it does not scale like what we do because the chip size may get larger. Last time I showed you two, two, how, how they are connected together, right? So that as a result, the total Y capacitor will scale by, uh, uh, will scale differently, right? So W and L, we scale by S and SL. And then the thickness scale by S, so this got canceled out. So your capacitance will scale by one over SL. Right, so that is uh, one of the way to see the scaling of the capacitance of the wire. Right? The main, main, main point to get is that you have to remember when we scale the wire, while we might make it narrower and also thinner, but the length we won't because for functionality, right? Your, your goal to go from one technology to another technology is not just to make the chip smaller as seen before. Usually we make transistors smaller, but the chip actually get larger to have more function. So the L might not scale as fast as the other dimension. So the capacitance actually uh, will scale based one over SL. You know, won't scale as fast as that. Is that clear? Any questions?
Now, if no, then what happened if we have fringing capacitance, right? It's impossible to have a parallel plates, right? So this is what I mean by fringing cap. Right, the electric field will leak laterally. Okay, so uh, there's a theory. It say that you know what? Uh, if this is W and this is H, the total capacitance is equal to a fringing capacitance C P P no C fringe plus C P P. And but this C P P PP means parallel plate. Right? This VP, CPP is modified a little bit. It's not the full width. It's full width minus H divided by two. Right? So if you do this, you see that this one is no longer W. Capital W is capital W minus H divided by two. This one gives me the parallel plate capacitance. And then the fringe field capacitance is just the wire, which we also have an analytical solution, this one. So total capacitance equals to this. It is more than just this original one, which is W times DI, epsilon DI by T D I is larger. Maybe not. We should not say much larger, but this is larger. So when you scale the cap the width, you actually do not reduce the capacitance. But remember, capacitance reduce uh change our delay right right here. So when we go from one technology to another technology, yeah, this capacitance is getting smaller, but it's not getting faster as what we want because of the fringing field. And this is shown in this figure, right? When W divided by H is large, means we can follow the parallel plates, the W and H, right? W is very large, so it's like par parallel plates. You see that when I uh, reduce it, I do follow the line. But eventually, when the W reduce, uh, and H gets W becomes smaller than the H, the capacitor tail off. Okay, level off. And we cannot further scale the device. So we cannot just reduce W. Right? So of course, when you reduce W, you also, also increase the resistance. So RC delay will increase. But in the past, you may think that my resistance go down linearly, and then the W go down linearly, uh, the capacitance also go down linearly, so the delay will be the same. But it's not true. The delay actually will increase if you scale it. And this is uh, shown here, right? This is not really the delay, but still it show you clearly that when you go from a large design rule to a smaller design rule, you see the inter y capacitor will increase also because of the fringing field. And but of course here also because their distance gets smaller. So in order to optimize it, you will need to find the optimal point. Is that clear? Any questions? But if no, then nowadays, what are we doing to improve the delay? You see that the wire capacitance, right? Let's go back to this equation. It depends on epsilon, right? So what is epsilon? It is the epsilon of this dielectric. So how do we improve it? Well, can we reduce it? For example, one. And what has one as the permittivity? free space. So you cannot add anything. So at the beginning, they try to add some organic material to reduce the permittivity compared to silicon dioxide. But that's not enough. Nowadays, we are actually using air gap. So this is a very difficult fabrication process, but they, they achieve it, right? It's very amazing. 
Why it is complicated? First of all, if there's nothing, only air gap inside, it means it can collapse during the fabrication process if you don't do it well. Secondly, the reliability is an issue, right? It's, it will be easy to crack. But by doing this air gap, I can reduce the capacitance by 3.9x compared to silicon dioxide. There's a loss, think about that 3.9x, if all the delay is limited by the wire capacitance, then it means you can increase your frequency by one gigahertz to four gigahertz, right? Isn't that is a big deal, right? Of course, that is not just limited by this, but you see that three, four times is very important. So that's why it deserves them to spend so much money at that time to develop this technology. Okay, any questions? Professor, on slide 11, that was showing the optimal ratio for W over L to find the best capacitance. Uh, no, so, sorry, this is not exactly just W over L, it's actually also including the uh, interlayer cap uh, interwire capacitance. So this is more about the design rule. I did not say it clearly. So when you make the design rule smaller, you reduce the feature size. And at the same, same time, the distance is also smaller. So as a result, your interwire capacitance will increase because the distance is smaller. The, the, so the capacitance is going to increase as the distance decreases? Yes. Right? Your regular capacitance reduced because you have smaller W, right? When you have this a smaller design loop, right? But however, this increase because the distance, interwire distance, also decrease, right? Because the capacitance here is proportional to the epsilon divided by the D. Oh, that makes sense, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this, sorry about this. I, I messed up uh, this line and this line. Uh, this is more about the design rule, design rule. Any other question? Of course, these are all old technology. However, it is still true nowadays and now become more important because, of, because the transistors are so good, we need DTCO. You really need to think about all this routing. 